end of the presentation. Also, we love to hear from you. We would love your thoughts on this and other programs you attend and ideas for programs to come. Your feedback helps us to plan future events. You may do so on the Fayetteville Public Library website, falib.org. Also, Genealogy's next hosted event is on Saturday, August 14th from 2 to 3. It is virtual also, and it's Beyond Names and Dates, filling in the stories of our female ancestors with professional genealogist and lecturer Pam Vestal. Hope to see you there. With that, Abby Burnett, inquisitive, noted cemetery researcher and author, is here to share some of the more unique homages she has come across in her cemetery research and travels, those of people's pets. I find it always a pleasure when she presents. Welcome, Abby Burnett. Good evening, thank you for joining us. Uh, this talk tonight started with this picture. The dog that made me do it is this little dog and this little girl. Because this picture showed up on the Arkansas History Listserv several years ago, and I was immediately taken by, her, by it. First of all, because the picture was taken in Harrison, Arkansas, and because written on the back was the name Bernice Yvette Mabel Johnson and friend. The handwriting's a little bad. I think it says and friend. But the fact is, I go back and forth on whether this is a real dog or not. Mabel's picture was taken probably in the early 1920s. Did they bring her pet? Is that a photographer's prop? Is it a toy? I can't me think it's her pet, but then again I look at it and think, no, it's a prop. It's a toy. I just don't know. But this picture and that dog got me started thinking about the many ways in which our pets play such an important role in our lives, and then when we die, that our loved ones will include them on our tombstones. So, for example, it is so easy to find dog artwork. And that's not really a surprise because modern stones are filled with all kinds of things that our ancestors would never have put on a tombstone. They, we've gotten away from religious symbolism, and we've gone with pictures of things that the deceased loved in life. So that might be the Razorbacks, it might be a motorcycle, their tattoos, bottles of Coke or cans of Pepsi. I have seen in our lives that we commemorate them along with mom and dad. So, uh, generic pictures, stock art, to which has been added the, the pet's name. I think my favorite is My Blessing, the pit bull in the lower corner. But all these pictures probably just came from a book of, of artwork. But it's also possible to find the actual dog on a stone. The art of the photo ceramic has been around since before the Civil War, and that means taking a photograph and transferring it to a little disc of either ceramic or metal and then attaching that to a tombstone. So, of course, uh, people put on their stones. The, the black and white one up in the corner was labeled uh, Old Rough, and that's up in Missouri. But the rest of these are all, on, I think, all on Arkansas tombstones. Well, of course, it's also possible to find pictures of people with their pets. Again, studio portraits, the person in life. The lower right-hand corner has a little dog lying on his back and looks so happy. Or um, couples with their dogs. And then something like this, which I just love, I be Lynn Acklin, who died about a year apart. And I don't know if they their children chose pictures of mom and dad to go on the stones, but mom and dad are each holding the same dog. That little peanut was so important to the Acklands that each one wanted to be photographed with their pet, and that goes on their tombstone. Sometimes we find epitaphs, which is too of my 
as well as the master loves his sheep, I'd give any little kid my last nickel. Coy, last I knew, was still alive, and there's a pile of nickels on the base of his tombstone. Or this. This is a husband and wife stone, and on the back they list the names of their children, which is fairly, fairly, that's done fairly often. But if you notice down at the bottom, they have little Gaby, the dog, who is listed with the kids. That dog was a member of the family. As was this one. This is a husband and wife, and in the middle is a picture taken at, a fa I assume, a family reunion. And there's the dog, front and center, in the front row, a member of the family. Sometimes I think people choose pictures just because these were maybe a very happy moment in their lives. The woman who is showing her corgis, the man about to throw a ball, the dog in the recliner with his owner, everybody there, the hunting dog, everyone just looks so happy. And you can see why these pictures were chosen. But just as our pets are with us during some of the happiest times of our lives, These are the Bull Duke murders. And the story was that their older son, their 21-year-old son, Matthew, came back to the family home and sort of, I guess, lay in wait. And one by one, the family members returned. And he killed his mother, his stepfather, and his little brother, and the family dog, Spike. And then he set the house on fire. Matthew pleaded guilty in a serving life sentence, but the fact is that whoever picked out this stone chose to include Spike and gave him the same death date that every member of the family has, and it says they are together forever. Well, it's not just dogs that show up on tombstones, of course. We also have people who love their horses and love their mules. The man in the middle who's driving the team of mules, I'm told, uh, showed up at a class reunion on Snowball, and everybody else is this tombstone. But obviously, one man had a racehorse. Uh, the horses, the mules, they show up pretty, fairly prominently on tombstones, too. And then so do other animals. Uh, this is in Maplewood Cemetery outside, your, outside of Harrison. And if you notice, the Johnson bench has got a cow who apparently is a Razorback fan. Go Hogs. Maplewood Cemetery is a wonderful place to find people's pets. It's a, it's a large cemetery with a lot of new markers. And behind Maplewood is Maple Leaf, an extension. Maple Leaf, I have challenged uh, viewers sometimes, people at my talk, to go to Maple Leaf and do a scavenger hunt and see how many pets they can find. Because there are lawn ornaments, there are epitaphs, there is artwork, there are, there are pictures. So lots and lots of pets. But this same cemetery has got the grave of Brian Harness. Now, Brian is holding a fox. And I have given this talk uh, in Harrison. And when I showed this picture, people in the audience remembered Brian. And they told me that he was a master taxidermist. Not just a, a taxidermist, but he was so good, he was a judge in taxidermy contests. And when I first found Brian's picture and that fox, I looked him up online. And when I saw that he was a taxidermist, I thought, oh my, that's a very lifelike representation of his work. But luckily, I found his obituary. And it has this picture. And it says in his obituary that Brian loved his cat, especially his Labrador tank and fox, Jasper. So Jasper is very much alive in these pictures. Well, while we're on the subject of exotic pets, I have to just deviate slightly to show you this picture of Frances Padilla Loader. Now, I don't know that these are necessarily her pets. These are her livelihood, because Frances was a snake charmer, snake handler in a circus. And if you're interested in circus folk and their burials and their very unusual tombstones, in other words, if you have a bucket list of things to visit, I recommend Hugo, Oklahoma, and Showman's Rest Cemetery. It's an easy day's drive. You can, do it, you can go there and back in a day. And the, the rule was that if you're buried in Showman's Rest, which is inside of Mount Olivet Cemetery, which is the Hugo Cemetery, you have to have a connection with the circus. So that connection can be you could have been a truck driver. It didn't matter. But you had to have some connection to be buried there. So the stones have got interesting artwork, interesting epitaphs, interesting uh, photographs. 
Here's a, here's a picture of a kind of an overview of one corner of showman's rest. So you have elven trainers, you have people who uh, were the master of ceremony, ringmasters, wagon wheels. Some really interesting inscriptions. One says, uh, there's nothing left but tire tracks and popcorn sacks. The circus has left town. But the idea was that these small circuses, the mom and pop circuses, you know, not ringling broad. would go out on the road during warm weather. So when a circus uh, member died, the body would be brought back to showman's rest and buried there. As a result, you get things like this. Uh, it will tell on the marker the name of the circus or circuses that the person worked for. Uh, Zefta Loyal was a bareback uh, rider, and her picture, I'm going to give you a close-up, shows her with her horse, but in the lower left-hand corner, it shows her jumping backwards through a flaming hoop. A lot of the markers there have got pictures of animals, and the animals, I presume, are not buried there, but it will show what the person did in life. I find some of them very disturbing. The ones where the, where the elephant trainers often show the elephant shackled and the trainer holding a large iron hook in one hand. There are several of those. Another aside to this aside, and that is if you go to Hugo and you go to Mount Olivet, go into the main part of the cemetery because there are a number of champion bull riders who are buried there. Freckles Brown, uh, who was a world champion bull rider in 1962. Lane Frost, who died at age 26 in 1989. He was 1987 champion. Todd, I think it's Waitley, uh, who was 1953 champion. Uh, Lane Frost is buried next to Freckles Brown. It was a request because Brown was his idol. And they'll be shown on the bulls, uh, on Tornado, on Red Rock, and so forth. Um, so that, that's, a, that's another part of the cemetery that's also very interesting. Those, as I said, those animals are not buried there. But if you go, um, oh, I'm try I didn't write, make my notes very well here. National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum has got a number of uh, champion bulls buried in their garden. Well, after all of these, we've gone through snakes and um, fox and horses and mules and so forth. There was a problem I had when I was looking for these markers, and that was, well, where are the birds? Because birds live a long time, and people have parrots and macaws and cockatoos and cockatiels. Uh, they live long lives. They are also beloved pets. Where are the birds? And in uh, all this searching, and at this point, I have been to about 1,200 graveyards in Arkansas, many of them multiple times, and then, of course, cemeteries outside of the state. In all of those cemeteries, I didn't find any birds, and um, other than hummingbirds. Hummingbirds show up on women's markers a lot. Finally, I was over near Stuttgart, and I found this. A boy and his pet duck. I mean, I was just enthralled. And not only a boy and his pit duck, but if you look, he's holding the duck's ankle. He is pointing out the fact that he bought that duck a bracelet. He bought his duck jewelry. At this point in my talk, I always say, you know, I'm messing with you, right? OK. But I do love this picture, even though it doesn't quite fit our theme tonight. Well, then the other question, of course, that may be on people's minds is, OK, we've gone through all of these animals and a duck. Where are the cats? Where are the cats? And I sympathize. I, have, I did a little bit of research before I, this talk. Uh, more likely to have a single dog, but multiple cats. And after all, the term crazy cat lady went into our language. We think of people as having multiple cats their family members too, where are the cats? And I'm here to tell you that this is the sum total of all the cat pictures I have ever found in all of the cemeteries I have been to. I can't explain it. Why are there not more photographs? And the cat on the leopard skin uh, throw was on the opposite side of the bench that had the cow on it in Harrison. The man in the lower right corner is holding a kitten on his lap in addition to the little puppy. Um, the couple in the upper right-hand corner, the cat looks pretty unhappy about everything. I can't explain why the cats are not out there. Um, there is some cat artwork. These, again, are generic cats. I have found them on more than one grave, most of them. 
uh, from a book of artwork. They're not meant to be portraits, I don't think. There's no names associated with them. And it just makes me wonder, why not? And I don't know. I have no answer to this. This is one exception. This is in Siloam Springs. Leonardo, his cat, and Rosie, her cat. So there is a couple who, who had portraits made of theirs. Um, I have found one epitaph, if you can call it that. This is a bench rather than a, a gravestone, but it, it marks a grave. And in the corner it says, be kind to cats. So um, that's pretty much everything I have for felines. Now, I put this picture in just as a reminder to myself, because I'm going to switch gears at this point. Um, this is taken in uh, Shawnee, Oklahoma. The town cemetery is amazing. It has all kinds of carvings, all kinds of old photographs. And I found this picture, Frank's dog, buried next to Frank, uh, Louis Francis Etherton. And I have tried to find the story, and I can't. I think the A couple of dogs, uh, some some dog burials here in Arkansas, and or not dog burials, dog uh, symbolism, let's say, or dog statuary. This is a uh, if you look at a book on tombstone symbolism, they it will books uh, such as um, Douglas. Uh, oh, I just lost his name. There's one called Stories in Stone, uh, which is a, a little handbook of symbols. But pretty much any book will tell you that the dog represents loyalty, faithfulness, fidelity, loyalty, and so forth. And this dog is, uh, below his paws, is the word fidelity. And I'm sorry, it says the word waiting. And on the back of the stone is the word fidelity. I don't really understand why this is there. I don't think it's meant to be symbolic. The dog has a collar carved around its neck, and on the collar is the name Pedro. The dog is also in a sort of a slightly slouched position. It's an Irish setter. It's in remarkably good shape, um, with the word waiting, and then, uh, as I said, behind it is the word fidelity. So Pedro is faithfully waiting, perhaps for his owner to come back. Now, if you go to Helena and you ask Pedro, shot Dr. Moore's dog, and he was killed defending it. One is that Pedro grieved himself to death on Dr. Moore's grave because his master didn't come home. Um, one was that uh, the, dog was, the dog and the owner were both shot in some uh, feud. In any event, nobody really has an answer. Presumably, it is a real dog. But I, I need to tell you about Dr. Moore, the, the man for whom the dog is faithfully waiting, because um, on the base of the dog statue, it says that Dr. Emil Overton Moore was murdered in uh, 1893. And the, the, the base below the word waiting is covered in writing. I'm only going to read you a little part of it. My favorite part says that Dr. Moore possessed marked individuality. He was incapable of dissimulation, meaning lying, I guess. His errors were the errors of a man, and they stood out in bold contrast with the time-serving, two-faced hypocrites who conspired to have him murdered. So this is a pretty noble story. The dog is waiting for his master. Dr. Moore was murdered. It was, there was a conspiracy to have him murdered. But as for so many wonderful stones, the story behind it is a little bit different than it would appear. Dr. Moore, uh, according to the newspaper, the Helena newspaper, after all of this happened, said that Moore was a very dangerous man and a terror to the community when drinking. And the fact is that, yes, everybody was terrified of Dr. Moore. He, about 10 years earlier, killed one of his patients in cold blood and been acquitted. Uh, Moore's patient was an elderly man. The two of them fought over, uh, argued about politics, and supposedly the old man came at Moore with his walking stick raised, and Moore shot him dead and was acquitted. So people had a reason to be afraid of Dr. Moore. Now, his whole story is there in the Helena and the Little Rock newspapers, and that is that basically um, one of Dr. Moore's patients out in the country broke his leg. He sent for Dr. Moore, but nobody him. 
So the man who had gone to find Moore found Dr. Chenault instead and brought him back, and Dr. Chenault was setting the patient's leg when Moore showed up, and Moore was furious, and I suspect drunk and violently angry. So the two doctors argued. In fact, they went out onto the porch, and they argued over who had the right to take care of this patient. And Dr. Moore reached into his coat. And Dr. Chenault believed that Moore was reaching for his gun. And so Chenault pulled out his own gun and shot Moore through the head and killed him instantly, and then turned himself in and remained in jail until the inquest, uh, which found him uh, not guilty by reason of self-defense. A little coda to this story is that uh, Dr. Moore's wife was in Nashville at the time with their two young children, a little boy who was 11 and a little girl who was four. And when she went to try and get Dr. Moore's life insurance, he had a policy for $5,000, first she was denied on the grounds that he brought about his own death because he fought, and then come to find out he had taken his children off of his policy and signed the policy over to a young woman in town who he said was his fiance, or at least she claimed to be his fiance and said that the life insurance policy was his, his engagement present to her. She had to go to the court three times to get the money, but eventually she prevailed, and I do think that, that this dog was paid for by Moore's parents, who were buried a short distance away, and they had had an obelisk put up before they died, and it's covered in writing, too. So I think these were probably both carved in Memphis. I should just mention that that $5,000 life insurance policy in 1893 is worth about $85,000 in today's money. So that was the story of Dr. Moore, and I think his parents probably chose that rather inflammatory language on the base of his stone, trying to vindicate their son. Dr. Chenault had a, went on to have a very illustrious career as a doctor, first in Helena, then in Little Rock, where he became the head of the Arkansas Medical Association for some time. When he died, his body was brought back and buried in the same cemetery as Dr. Moore. And this is strictly coincidental, but not far from the, the statue of Pedro is this brick. It's not in the Moore plot. It's in someone else's plot. But it's a short distance away. I'd like to think that the brick was made in Helena. And a dog or a cat ran across it when the clay was still wet. And, and somebody just put it into, in the cemetery. And I just find that like a nice little unrelated, uh, part of the, uh, unrelated touch. Well, my other example of a dog carving is in Jonesboro. And this is Thelma Holford. And Thelma uh, was, called herself the world's first awning woman. Apparently she'd been married quite young, she divorced, and that is a life-size statue of Thelma in her little house dress and her sensible shoes, her wristwatches on her wrist. I'll show you what her sign says. It says, don't be afraid to stand alone. There are a lot of stories about Thelma. For one thing, when the, uh, the statue was vandalized a few years ago, they caught the kid that did it, in the, and it was, the, by encasing her in plaster, which makes no sense. In fact, a local company took pictures of her and measurements, sent these off to Italy, and the Italian sculptors sent back a, a, a model of what they were going to make, and Thelma had to approve it. She approved her own statue, but she said, you've made my dog Bunny look like, I think it was an elephant, and Bunny had to be recarved to Thelma's satisfaction. Uh, on the base of Thelma, or Thelma's in an above ground uh, mausoleum or crypt, and it says on the front, my daily prayers, I'm just going to go back to Thelma's picture Why I do this, my daily prayers, God help me keep my long nose out of other people's business and give me 26 hours each day to mind my own. She was a character. People I've talked to in Jonesboro who remember almost like immediately, but um, it's a large plot of land and one of the groundskeepers or caretaker told me when I visited that they'd had a pet funeral just the day or two before where the dog was carried in with pallbearers and there was a minister preaching a funeral. Um, not the only pet cemetery in Arkansas, obviously, but, a, but an interesting one. I'm going to talk a little bit now about working dogs. Um, this is St. Boniface Church in Perry County. It's a beautiful piece of architecture. And I call your attention to the little plantings to the right of the front steps, right there. Because hidden in that 
bush is this little tombstone. And it says, Sheba, the St. Boniface greeter dog. The story of, of Sheba is that um, Father James West, the, the priest of this parish, found Sheba beside the road when she was a puppy, and he brought her back to the rectory to live. And all was well for a long time. Sheba was the greeter. She would sit up on the front porch. In fact, here's a picture of her. It's the only one I've found. But she would sit on the front porch and for mass. But sadly, after Father West left and a new priest arrived, uh, Sheba was killed crossing the highway, which is, runs very close to this church. And a parishioner had that stone made for her. I should say that she is not buried in the cemetery, which is to the right of the church, and has some very interesting markers, including a marker for husband, wife, and children who were killed in one of the largest mass murders uh, on the record books committed by a family member, which took place over in um, Dover, Arkansas. Um, you, you would know from the stone because it hints. It has a, a, a quote about the knife of the assassin. But in any event, it's an interesting cemetery. And of course, Sheba, Sheba stone is a one of a kind. Another dog, uh, cemetery type uh, cemetery dog, is in Grace Hill, in uh, Grace Hill Cemetery in Perry, Oklahoma. A number of years ago, I had to get up and drive some of uh, our shelter dogs where I volunteer at Paws and Claws. I drove them to Perry, Oklahoma to meet a transport because they were going on to another state where they could be adopted. And after I met the transport drivers, I had time to kill and I thought, I, I wonder what the town cemetery looks like. So I, I apologized profusely, and I said, well, I love cemeteries. Is there anything I should be sure to see while I'm here? Because the place was enormous, and it has all... And we walked outside the gates, and if you see, there's a big sign that says, no dogs allowed, city ordinance, blah, blah, blah. But if you look over here, there is a tombstone. And it says, Little Britches, the cemetery dog. And this is a story that the groundskeeper told me that there had been a man who took care of the cemetery some time back, and he spent much of his time drunk, and I think in a tool shed, but his dog came to work with him every day. Life, I think, in the cemetery, but when Little Bridges died, he was denied a burial inside the cemetery, and he's buried outside the gates. And which makes me sad, because this is the dog's job, going to work with his owner. The caretaker did say to me, I, don't, I forget if I asked, I said, well, do you think there are any dogs buried in Grace Hill? And he said, all the time. He said, I come to work in the morning, and I will find a fresh pile of dirt, a small fresh pile of dirt, on a grave or on a family plot, which says to me, someone's just buried a cat or a dog. And I said, what do you do? And he said, I leave it alone. So my guess is there are quite a few pets inside, but Little Britches is on the outside. But... At one time, we weren't that concerned or that worried about. This is um, the Jenkins plot in Oakland Cemetery in Russellville. And it's a whole row of stones for the family, but the one in the left-hand corner is for Moochie, who I believe was a cat. And elsewhere in the cemetery is a dog's headstone. I've heard of it, but I've never been able to find it. But that's a cemetery that's got two pets, as is a Hollywood Cemetery in Hot Springs. The rector plot, which has um, columns for three children, has Washita, our pet, not the children's pet. It, was a, it came along later in the family. And elsewhere in the cemetery are matching headstones for a child and a dog who died about a week in that family's plot. So putting a, a pet in with us is not that shocking. Sometimes I think it's just done very subtly. This is Green Lawn Cemetery in Rich Hill, Missouri. And I happen to notice this little stone in between two family markers, and it says Duke. So I'm guessing that that's a pet, especially because there's a little dog there on the, on the base of another marker. Well, while we're talking about working dogs, you kind of have to talk about hunting dogs. Although I think dogs hunt because they enjoy it. Uh, people use them for this. And the artwork showing dogs treeing something, I have dozens and dozens of examples. This one I just happen to like because there's three of them and there's a, racco a raccoon, but there's so many versions of the dog treeing on daddy's side of the, of the headstone. 
This is in Madison County, where I live, and I, something I found a long time ago. At Mama's side has got a hummingbird on it. Uh, Dad's side has got dogs treeing. And all I can assume is this was just a very proud day for him and his dogs. There's three hound dogs. I don't know what they've got up that tree, but they are pretty excited about it. And dogs, dogs at work. Another uh, example of hunting dogs on a human's tombstone is Billy D. Carter's marker. He is in uh, Union Hill in Newton County near Parthenon. And I have gone back several times and tried to get better versions of this picture. It's a little blurry in the original. And I can't decide how many golden retrievers are in that picture. I count at least three, but I sometimes think there's a fourth one behind him. But I also found uh, Billy's obituary, and my favorite line was that he was liked by most. So there's Billy, about to shoot something out of a tree, I guess. Well, when we talk about hunting dogs, we almost have to talk about the Coon Dog Cemetery, um, which is in Cherokee, Alabama. It's the Key Underwood Coon Dog Memorial Cemetery. And I'm throwing this in. I did say I wasn't going to talk about pet cemeteries, but this one is so unusual. Now, unfortunately, I went to Alabama for a Gravestone Studies conference, and I did not make a whole separate day trip to see this. A lot of people in the conference did, and I'm sorry now that I didn't. This is a very famous pet cemetery. Uh, that is Key Underwood and his dog Troop, and that's what started this. The Coon Dog Memorial Cemetery is extremely strict. Your dog has got to be a coon dog to be buried there, and they will dig it up if they think you're lying to them. You have to have papers, and you have to have, I think it's two witnesses who remember the dog in life to vouch for the fact that it was a coon dog, and I think maybe Huntrith, and another that I love. He wasn't the best, but he was the best I ever had. Stacks of artwork in the middle. Again, dogs treeing something. And it is so famous that it shows up in a movie. If you've ever seen Reese Witherspoon's movie Sweet Home Alabama, there is a coon dog cemetery. Sorry, this is so dark. Uh, it's all made for the movie. They did not film in the actual one. In fact, her character walks off the main street, sees the coon dog cemetery, and discovers that her dog, Old Blue, has died in her absence, and she has an emotional moment. So, but there's the coon dog cemetery now uh, transferred into movies. Another example of somebody who loved his hunting dogs is Colonel Wildridge. He is buried in Mayfield, Kentucky, and it's very hard to do justice to just how strange his marker is. Um, it is filled with statuary. In fact, I'm going to have to show you some antique uh, postcards, which gives you a better example. It is called The Procession That Never Moves. Colonel Wooldridge had so much money to burn that he had himself sculpted twice, once on horseback and once standing up. And then he had all of his brothers and his sisters and his mother sculpted, but by then there were no photos, so these are just generic statues of women and men. Note that his father is not sculpted because he abandoned the family and eight children, so he Um, shown chasing an animal. So Bob, and it says Bob on the dog's collar, Bob is chasing a fox and Toehead is chasing a deer. The deer's been vandalized, his antlers have been snapped off, but the, he has two on either side of this big collection are the two dogs and their prey. Well, my last example of a hunting story, and it's a very sad one, is this one in Butlerville in Lone Oak County. Uh, this is Robert Marsh. And it says that he died from accidental gunshot, age 14 years, one month, and one day. And not only does it say how he died, which is rare on stones, but it says that he was found by the barking of his faithful dogs, Jack. And the picture at the top is a representation of the boy. He's on his back holding his gun. And if you can tell, nestled on either side of him are his two dogs, who apparently stayed with him until he was found. The stone has got trees and grapevines in the back. They're very sh faintly carved, but it's a, a stone filled with information and detail. And it's absolutely
are. Um, this is a story I've never told before. I have given this talk, I have talked about pets, I've talked about unusual of Santa Fe Bow. Um, He's, it's not a mystery. If you went to, to Shawnee, Oklahoma, you would find people who could, who could talk about it. There have been newspaper articles. Um, but I absolutely am just uh, so caught up in this story. The story is, and this is the dog we're talking about. This is the only photo known to have been taken of Bo. He was described as a white and black spotted coach and bulldog, or as alternately as an English bulldog. And Bo came to, to Shawnee probably around 1905 as a I think a, a woman in town. And uh, Shawnee is a home of many railroads. It has three rail, major railroads that run through it and three depots. And there's sort of a lot of train, tr train activity. Well, one day, one of the train workers was walking home. I think he worked a night shift. He's walking home, and he sees his little puppy out on the sidewalk. And he stops, and he, he romps with the dog. That was his term. He, the, he romped with it. And the puppy loved the attention. And the next day, maybe a couple more workers. They, they, the, the train men start to play with the dog, and the dog starts to follow them. Eventually, the woman who owns the dog says, keep him. He's yours. He won't stay at home. But the dog basically adopts the, the, the railroad's yard master who works at night. And eventually, the workers on their way to work give him a ride on the boomer. The boomer was a little train that would carry the workers out to the shops. This was such a huge terminus that the trains had to be repaired. There was a upholstery shop, a woodworking shop, and so forth. And the men also had uh, bunks, a restaurant, and a reading room. So there's like a little city outside of town, and this little train, the boomer, would take them to work. That's how Bo got his name. So perhaps he should be called Boo. But in any event, he, was, he, he, he hopped on the boomer. He loved it. They took him to work with them. And at that moment, Bo's real active life began. There are so many stories of Bo. In fact, when Bo died, the uh, Employees Magazine published a long obituary filled with stories of Bo. Two men in town who had been railroad men were interviewed, and they told their own Bo stories. And then there's even a third published, or sorry, a fourth published piece about him. This dog had such an active life. He loved to ride on the trains. He learned to hop on a moving train on what was called the footboard, and he would ride with the engineer. Sometimes. He Set the conductor so much that he told Bo he was no longer welcome. The next day, the train takes off. The conductor hears an odd thumping noise, and he starts to investigate. And Bo is under one of the seats. He's hidden himself because he knows he's not supposed to be there. But he's so happy he can't stop wagging his tail, and that thumps on the floor, and that gives him away. The um, railroad men bought Bo a leather collar with a brass tag with the Santa Fe logo on it, and I think maybe their address because Bo traveled so much that they didn't want him to get lost. Uh, Bo traveled somewhere between whenever he wanted, and he went as far away as Denver, Colorado, Fort Worth, Texas, into New Mexico. And when he arrived at some other terminus, the station master would simply send a telegram uh, back to Oklahoma to say, we've got Bo, we'll put him on the train back tomorrow morning. And then Bo would go home with one of them and spend the night. The men loved Bo so much that they would buy him a steak at their restaurant. They took him to the movies. He would get his own seat. He would sit quietly and watch the movie unless a fight or some kind of action happened on screen, in which case he, he'd lose it. He'd just have to bark. He liked to ride the streetcar. If he couldn't find a train, it said Bo never walked to town. He knew the, tra the, the streetcar schedule, and he would hop on the streetcar. When rabies broke out in Shawnee and the dog catcher was going around killing dogs in town, which was the only known cure at that time, uh, he, he made an exception for Bo because he knew he'd have to fight every train man if he did anything to that dog. Well, in 1909, Bo lost a leg. It's a grisly story. I won't go into it. it it's really horrible. But he got injured trying to bite a pig. A pig was being loaded onto a boxcar, and Bo hated pigs. And he went after the pig, and he got, his leg got smashed by a train wheel and had to be And recovered, he resumed his travels on the train. Uh, finally, by 1918, his health was starting to fail, and Bo stopped riding the rails, but he still continued to hang out in the, in the yards with the men. 
there's so many stories. There's a story of him uh, chasing off a burglar, getting shot, having to have buckshot pulled, removed from him. By 1919, Bo was blind, and it said in his obituary that the men in the shops cared for him like a baby. By that point, he was starting to get a little maybe doggy dementia. He started to wander, and they really worried about him. They had to find him and bring him back. But finally, by 1920, and by August of 1920, they realized that Bo was in pain, and it was time to let him go. Um, what they did was they used chloroform, and they gave it to him, put him in a box with a blanket, and then they waited all day to make sure he was gone. In that time, the, the railroad carpenters built a wooden box a coffin for him. The railroad finishers polished the box. The railroad upholsterers lined and trimmed the box with car plush. That's the plush seats. It was the, the fabric that was used on the train seats. They put or I guess they said five o'clock. They dug a grave for him under a cottonwood tree beside the tracks. And it said there was not a man who wasn't sobbing as they lowered Bo down to his, into his grave. Now then they took up a collection, and in 1920 they spent $15 to buy Bo a tombstone. This is the only picture I have seen of the stone when it was in place uh, beside the tracks. And if you notice, the dog is missing a left hind leg, which is the one that was amputated. And it's hard to see, but hanging from Bo's collar is a very large tag. Now, unfortunately, the stone was vandalized by some kids a few years ago, and that's what they did to his marker. So uh, the town museum, which is now housed inside the Santa Fe uh, Railroad Depot, decided to have a replica made. And this is it. It does not show, they didn't put the, the tags on his collar, but he is still missing a leg. And they moved Bo, supposedly dug him up, which is next to the ra railroad depot. Uh, the director of the museum did tell me that they didn't find anything when they dug. They, they thought they'd find a copper box, because one account says that it was, he was buried in a copper coffin. They didn't find that or the glass. They didn't even find any bones. But they did dig where they thought the grave was, and they moved that, and they gave him a new headstone. And that is the story of Bo, the railroad dog. He was not the only dog to ride the rails. You can do a search on newspapers.com and other railroad dogs will come up. Uh, I don't think any had the personality of Bo or they just haven't been written about. It, Bo's obituary has this to say. Bo was distinctly a Santa Fe acquisition, but he had a warm spot in his heart for all railroad men. Well, my last story is about Jim the Wonder Dog. And Jim is uh, in Marshall, Missouri. And this, I went to Marshall. I went to Marshall just to learn more about Jim. I bought the t-shirt. I bought the book about him. I bought the video. There is so much love for Jim in Marshall. In fact, at one time, the town motto was, come, sit, stay. I had banners up, they're down now. But Jim the Wonder Dog has his own memorial garden right off the main square. And it is in what was originally the Van Arsdale Hotel. The hotel is gone now. It's uh, a park in Jim's honor. He was a Llewellyn Spaniel, and that is, in fact, it was the, 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 the casting was made from an oil painting made by Mrs. Van Arsdale. So we know that this is a good uh, representation of him. If you go there, the visitor book is filled with names from all over the world. Um, and there are plaques telling Jim's story. It's going to be very hard to boil it down because it is such, there's just so much detail. The story is that Sam Van Arsdale, the owner of the hotel, bought a puppy in 1925 in order to hunt quail. This is what Jim looked like. It said he had human eyes. Um, so there's Sam Van Arsdale with Jim. And I don't know if Jim was a good hunter or not. It was said that he wasn't, he really didn't, I don't think he really took to hunting. Um, he may have been the run of the litter. I'm not, he's a little odd looking. But one day, uh, Sam Van Arsdale took Jim out in the country with them. Maybe let's go sit in the shade of the maple tree, and Jim went to the maple, and so on and so forth. So now Sam began to test his dog with all kinds of The fame of Jim grew, and people would come to town just to see him, and they would ask him things like, 
uh, well, one of the, the favorite thing was to have them point out a license plate. They'd say, Jim, find the car with the Colorado plates. The car might have been parked around the corner and not visible, but Jim would go right to it. It said he understood instructions in full sentences, in foreign languages, in Morse code, even requests written in shorthand. At one point, he was taken to the um, Missouri legislature to be shown off, and one of the did not believe that Jim had so he whispered the question out in shorthand, which was shown to Jim, and Sam said to his dog, answer the question, and the question was something like, which person here voted against the such and such bill? And the dog trots over and sits down. He could predict the sex of unborn children. It is said that he predicted the winner of the Kentucky Derby seven times. Uh, they would write out the horses' names. Jim would put his paw on whichever one was, it was. They would seal it up in an envelope, and only after the race was over would they unseal it, and Jim was Um, horse races and so forth. The Van Arsdales liked to travel and they would take Jim with them when they went. So one story was that they were in, I think it was in Florida, and they had the bellhop walk Jim. And the bellhop would you know, deviate, take a little detour to the racetrack and he'd place a bet. And somehow he would ask Jim who to bet on, Jim would tell him and he would get, he would win over and over. And he was cleaning up so much that the word got out that somebody decided we could steal Jim and make a fortune. And luckily, somebody slid a note under the Van Arsdale's door saying, if you value your dog, Van Arsdale was offered supposedly $364,000 to take Jim to Hollywood to be in movies. He turned it down. Jim was written about in Reader's Digest, Outdoor Life, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Uh, my, I think my all-time favorite story, though, is Mrs. Van Arsdale was always mad at her husband because he'd go in the bedroom to take a nap, and he'd throw all the little decorative pillows off the bed. And she would get after Sam about this. And one day, she went into the bedroom after her husband had napped, and there was Jim putting the pillows back on the bed. <laughs> so, and, and all of, there's, there's so many more stories. Uh, there are so many things you can find online. It was said that he was never trained to do any of this, that he just knew. Well, when Jim died, the Van Arsdales owned a large plot inside of Ridge Park Cemetery, and of course they logically assumed that their dog, their famous dog, would be buried in their plot, and the cemetery board said no, forbidden. So Jim was buried outside of the gates, outside of the fence. But after a few years passed, the cemetery was completely full and they needed more land, so they expanded the cemetery, they moved the gates and the fence, and now Jim is on the inside, and I would say his is the most visited grave of anything in there. A path, a well-beaten path, leads back to Jim's grave, and there he is, Jim the Wonder Dog, and school children leave toys, trinkets, little ceramic dogs, pennies on his grave. Um, the, the cemetery has a big sign up saying you, dogs, you shouldn't let dogs in, out in the cemetery, they have to be on a leash, but it is, it is wonderfully ironic that, they, that Jim is their most famous occupant. That brings me to the end of my favorite two animal tombstones and animal stories. Uh, I just want to close with another paw print. country cemetery, and if I had nature, I would really be tempted to steal it, but I, I like to go visit it. I don't know if it's a cat or a dog, but it is a, in, a, in a cemetery. I'm giving you my email address if you have any uh, cemetery questions. If you um, are working on genealogy, you have a family marker, if you have a verse you can't uh, make out or a symbol you'd like help interpreting, I would be happy to help. As I say, I live for this. I would be delighted to help you figure out something on a stone. I don't do military markers, but I can help you with religious and by the same token, if you find a great animal burial or story or anything really quirky or interesting in a cemetery, I hope you'll share that with me too. So thank you all very much. And I think we're going to take questions if there are any. In terms of animal, uh, my, what was the question is, what is the most surprising stone I've come across? And it doesn't have to be an animal burial. Um, I'm working on a book on the most unusual markers and cemeteries in Arkansas. And in the course of that, I've gone all over Arkansas looking for 
well, like 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 Dr. Emil Overton Moore's dog. That's a great marker, a great story. The true story is very different from what you take away from what's carved. But my favorite marker is a murder weapon that marks a man's grave. It is, um, it is there. It is uh, a woman killed her husband, and he richly deserved it. Oh, golly, he deserved it. And he is buried. Uh, she used a piece of a Model T Ford axle to hit him in the head twice. And that is, I can't prove that it's marking his grave because there is no other marker. But there is, um, the cemetery has been uh, read, and there are newspaper accounts. Um, not only did she kill him and was she acquitted, but she also claimed his life insurance and went on to remarry, and I hope have a very happy life. But the fact that a murder weapon is the man, and it is his only grave marker, uh, that has to, that's just like off the charts in, in terms of un <laughs> unusual, yeah. <laughs> So which comes first, the hearing about something and going to find it or just lucking onto something in a cemetery and going back and researching? Well, both. I love Facebook because there are so many uh, pages, Arkansas gravestones, Arkansas tombstones, cemetery enthusiasts, whatever, and I find things that way I would never or tombstones were the cause of death. So a lot of times I am going to find something, and then while I'm there I might find something else. Um, I'd say more often than not, I'm going there with the intent to find something that someone has told me about. And when I give talks, very often someone will say, well, do you know about the such and such? And I didn't. Um, you know, and a lot of times what people tell me in a talk is not quite what I find when I get there because details. Looking for amputated body parts, I was told about a man's big toe. Well, it turned out to be his whole foot, but you know, close enough. And I, he had a, it had a, a marker. So those kinds of things are so hard to find by themselves the amputated things or the cause of death. It's very, very small. And the chances of walking into a huge cemetery and just finding that amazing thing is pretty, is pretty small. I have had some great discoveries, just happenstance. But really, um, for the most part, somebody has told me. I spent a lot of time here at Fayetteville Library up in the genealogy department because the books are organized by county. So before I'm thinking about going on a trip, such as, um, over to see, oh, to Helena. I could go to that, the Phillips County. The murder weapon was found that way, and the boy, uh, Robert Marsh, killed by accidental discharge of his gun, that was found here in Fayetteville. It was a little line drawing on a cemetery enumeration, and that led me to his actual stone. Or a family that was killed in a tornado and then the husband committed suicide, and so their stones say, killed in the great storm, and his say, says, died by his own hand. I would probably never have spotted those inscriptions when I went there, but because I knew about them, I could go right there, and then once I got there, I made some other good discoveries. So it's, it's a little... Because somebody... Okay. I think that's it. All right. Much appreciate you coming. Sure. Thanks so much. I've enjoyed this.